And then it happened. You've heard a phrase like that, and it typically means all kinds of different things. And then it happened, whatever it is. For example, a few years ago, and by a few, I mean, I don't know, six or eight, somewhere in there, the years just kind of go together. My wife and I, we had the opportunity to rent a cabin over in the Smoky Mountains and stay there for a few days. Were we able to go hiking during the day? That was before my knee had all kinds of issues. Hiking during the day, and then in the evenings, we'd go into Gatlinburg and see the town and the sights and the lights and all of that. And I remember on one of those days that we were going to hike, we had this brochure that talked about a 74-foot waterfall. And we're thinking, oh, that's beautiful. We want to see that. And in the brochure, it said that that's a three-mile hike to get there. Well, we walk a lot. I, just, I walk most of the time anyways during the day. So a three-mile walk, we're thinking, that ain't nothing. We'll be able to get there no problem. What the brochure forgot to mention was that hike is more like this, uh, going up the side of a mountain. And so you haven't known discouragement unless you've been hiking for a solid hour, hour and a half, and you're thinking to yourself, oh, we're almost there. Oh, we've got to be there. And if someone's coming down as you're going up, and you ask them, you say, hey, how close are we? And they laugh. <laughs> and they say, you're not. Oh, that, we about turned around four times. But as we're going up this mountain, up this trail, this three-mile trail, it'd be real easy to get to, I suppose, took us about three hours, and we get to a point to where we're starting to move around this little switchback formation, and then you can hear the water rumbling. You can hear it flowing. You can hear people laughing. On the trail, we heard despair, but we could start to hear people laughing, and we're thinking, we've got to be there, but you look around, and there's no water. All there is is a trail, and then it happened. We took a little curve around a bush, around some foliage, came out to a clearing, and what we saw on display, this beautiful waterfall flowing into a few different pools as it works its way down. We made it up there, and the first thing we did was sit for about an hour and watch. One, because we're exhausted, but two, because it was beautiful to see. And then after that, we were able to get up and move around a little bit. We were able to get behind the waterfall, took a, real, so a couple of real nice pictures back there. Absolutely wonderful. We stayed up there for a few hours, and then we realized, you know, we didn't pack any food or water or anything. We should probably get back down. And when I told you that hike was steep, what I meant was it took us three hours to get up and about 40 minutes to get down. Uh, it's, you're hitting the brakes the whole way down. And then we got to have fun seeing the, the hikers full of despair, wondering how close they were. <laughs> you ain't nowhere near close, my friend. When we experienced wonder, what the second world around us calls wonder, calls awe, followers of Jesus call worship. Worship is simply responding to the presence of God, responding to the works of God in our lives and around us. We respond with worship when we respond with wonder. And you've experienced this in your life. If you, if you have children, you remember when your son, when your daughter was born, you remember the wonder that you experienced at seeing this life, this life that had been entrusted to you. And in that wonder, there's probably a little bit of fear, a little bit of dread, because you're wondering, how am I going to keep this thing alive? There's a little bit of trepidation there. At least that's what we experienced. Now, granted, when our first son was born, you know, it was the ripe old age of 17, and we have a picture, I should have brought it, but I didn't, of me with my bowl cut. Uh, for some reason, wearing a muscle shirt, I didn't have any of those. Uh, I think the thought process was probably if you wear the shirt, then the muscles will grow, but that didn't work at all. Uh, <laughs> skin and bones was about it. But wonder at seeing this life right there. You may have experienced this wonder if you grew up in a home where everybody was pinching pennies, where sometimes some the water bill or the water just didn't work for a day or where the lights didn't turn on for a couple of days as you're waiting for a paycheck to come in. And then fast forward, and now as an adult, you look back and you see, you know, we've been wise, we've tried to steward our finances well, 
but we've never gone without. And you experience wonder looking at the generosity of God and all that he has blessed you with. This wonder is what it is to worship. When we worship, we are walking in wonder. And the interesting thing about worship, everybody worships. We were created to worship. Every single person on the face of this world worships. They've all experienced wonder. The difference is the object of the worship. What strikes that wonder? You see, those things that I mentioned earlier, they can be legitimate sources of wonder and worship and point us to God, but they can also distract away from it. While a beautiful waterfall might cause some to worship, some might go too far and begin to worship the environment, to worship that waterfall itself. And when we do that, we're missing the point. Some folks, they go so far where they celebrate having a family, they celebrate their children and their spouse, but they live as if they worship their children and they worship their spouse. There's a reason why when you look at divorce statistics, there's a spike in the divorce rate right between years 18 and 20 because kids are starting to move out and the parents are starting to realize they have nothing to talk about because they've spent the last 20 years in effect worshiping their child and that child is gone. There's a reason why many, many folks experience a crisis of identity right around retirement age because they've spent the last 30 years, 40 years, 50 years in a role, and without knowing it, they begin to find their identity from that job. They begin to worship that job. And then when they retire, they're left with a crisis. What do we do now? I've had the privilege of walking with several folks in counseling just through that season of life. What do we do now? Some folks when they did experience that childhood of pinching pennies, of never having quite enough, of always having clothes that were stained or of rock bands you've never heard of because they were bought at a secondhand store, some people decide, I'm never going to live that way again. And so they begin working 80 hours a week, every week, to make sure they have enough money. And instead of money and generosity being a source of wonder for God, they begin to worship the money itself. And that's a problem as old as time. That's nothing new. We were created to worship. Everybody worships. Everybody experiences wonder. But the object of our wonder often changes, and it can lead to very, very great pain. But then we have to ask this question. If we're created to worship... If God created us to worship on purpose, and if we've all experienced the temptation of worshiping the wrong thing, in fact, if we're going to be honest, each one of us has, by some point in time in our lives, worshiped the wrong thing, we've not only felt the temptation, but we've given into that and walked in it, how does the Holy Spirit meet us in the midst of our worship? How does the Holy Spirit interact with our hearts as we desire wonder, as we naturally walk into worship? And I think the answer is this. The Holy Spirit leads us to a life of wonder focused on Jesus. As we follow the Holy Spirit, as we open our minds and our hearts to His leadings, we begin to experience a life of wonder. And not just any type of wonder, but of wonder that is focused on Jesus Christ, on seeing him not only in our lives, but in the lives of people around us, in the world around us. Now, the interesting thing about worship, and this is interesting in a negative sense, If you've been involved in church life, you've heard me reference this once already, you've seen divisions, you've seen church fights, you've seen church conflicts. You can turn on the news and find another church that's upset about something. You've seen all of these things. In churches, we have this tendency to fight about all kinds of different things, but I'm willing to wager the most common source of disagreement, of fighting, of conflict within a church is worship. The thing that's created to unite us the very action that we are all called to walk in together that God created us for. He created us to worship. 
But that worship causes more division and more strife than just about anything. Now, what do I mean by that? You've seen churches argue and get upset over this type of music played over instruments. Are we going to have instruments? Are we not going to have instruments? Is the organ the only holy, sacred instrument that we can have? Should it be a cappella? How many band members should we have? What style of music should we play? How long should the worship set go? Is two songs? Is five songs? What should we do within that? You've heard all kinds of disagreements about worship, and it always strikes me as puzzling. The very thing that, was called, that we are created to unify around causes more separation than just about anything. I heard someone say once, it shouldn't surprise us when the church struggles. It shouldn't surprise us when the church has strife. And I asked, well, why shouldn't that surprise us? And he looked at me and he says, have you not read Genesis chapter 3? Have you not heard of the fall? Have you not heard of the effects of sin and how that breaks through all every little aspect of life? He says the surprise isn't that churches struggle. He says the surprise is sometimes, sometimes the church gets it right. And I thought, ooh, ooh, that's good. That's real good. Today... We're concluding our series entitled The Holy Spirit Brings. Now, we've looked at a few different areas of life that the Holy Spirit meets us, where he impacts us, where he changes us. We've seen how the Holy Spirit brings prayer into our lives. We talked about what it means to pray in the Spirit. We talked about how the Holy Spirit brings clarity. He helps us to see reality for what it is. We talked about on Pentecost how the Holy Spirit brings power, power to witness, power to minister in this world. Last week, John showed us how the Holy Spirit brings fruit to our lives. Today, we're going to see how the Holy Spirit brings worship into our lives. And he does that by bringing wonder to our attention. Now, there are a myriad other things that the Holy Spirit brings into our lives where he meets us. We could spend an eternity, quite literally, discovering all the different ways that the Holy Spirit interacts with us. But today we're going to focus on worship. How does the Holy Spirit meet us in worship? Specifically, how does the Holy Spirit meet us in worship when we have the natural temptation, we as the church at large, to divide over the issue of worship? As I was thinking about this and praying about this and pondering it, the picture of a puzzle came to mind. Go ahead and put this up here. This was a puzzle that Caitlin and I did several years ago. And you don't need to count the pieces. There's about 2,000 of them up there, give or take. And when I say Caitlin and I did a 2,000-piece puzzle, I want you to notice there's a lot of trees and there's a lot of clouds in that puzzle. And so what I mean is, Kayla did a close to a 2,000-piece puzzle, and I added a few of the red pieces uh, kind of in the middle and stuff like that. I, get, I, I give up easily. It's just, it's just the way it is. But when we looked at the puzzle, when we first got the box, first thing we did, we're separating out the different colors. We're separating out the end pieces. And then we're trying to put it together in a way that works, in a way that fits. And many, many times, if there's 2,000 pieces here, that means at least 2,000 times we tried to put the wrong piece in, and it just didn't fit right. As I was looking at the Scripture for today, as I was looking at how the Holy Spirit brings worship, unity in worship, the picture of a puzzle came to mind. We're going to see different pieces of this puzzle in the Scripture, and then we're going to see how they might fit together and what keeps them together. And in the midst of this, we need to remember, there's somewhere around 100 churches, some odd churches in this town. Every single one of those churches puts these pieces together just a little bit differently. And that's okay. And so we're going to look at what are the pieces that we see from Scripture, and then what might they look like here at Centerpoint, so that we can answer God's invitation to walk in wonder. Today, we're going to look at a letter that Paul wrote to an early church, a church that had all kinds of issues, a church that when folks say, you know, sometimes you've heard people say, if only we could get back to the early church, and I want to ask, well, which one, which early church do you want to get back to? No one would say they want to be like this church, because this church had every issue in the book. 
In fact, Paul wrote two letters to them because they didn't get it right the first time. And many scholars think there was actually a third letter that he wrote that was just simply lost to history somewhere because they couldn't quite figure this out. And one of the struggles they were having was over worship. And so Paul writes to them, and I want you to see this. We're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, we're going to be bouncing around today, just fair warning, between 12, 13, and 14. And so if you want to follow along and keep up, great. The passages will also be on the screen. And so if you kind of lose where we are, that's okay. Uh, Follow along with us on the screen. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 to begin with. And I want us to see this unity that God calls us into in worship. This unity that he has for us when we walk in wonder. Even in the midst of all kinds of different styles and expressions of worship. And so the first place we'll look, look at verse 4. Here, Paul says, <clears throat> excuse me, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. At the end of service, Aaron is apt to remind us to keep the main thing the main thing because we naturally want to make secondary things the main thing. And here Paul seems to be agreeing. There's many different gifts. There's many different workings. There's many different expressions. But they're not the main thing. They're all there to serve the same God. He is the main thing. And so with that in mind, let's look at a few of these puzzle pieces that we see within the Scripture. The first one we'll find in the next verse. Look at verse 7. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. For the common good. Our first puzzle piece tells us that any aspect of worship and wonder we want to walk in, especially together as a church, it must be for the common good. You're going to see a theme about how Paul continually draws our attention outside of ourselves and puts it on to others, puts it on to the group as a whole. And he does that from the very beginning. Remember, what we do here in worship together, it's for the common good. What's our next piece of the puzzle? Skip down to verse 12. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. And then skip down to verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ. And each one of you is a part of it. We all make up the body of Christ of Christ. We cannot forget that every single person you've ever met is called to be a part of the body of Christ. The second puzzle piece that we have is this this expression of diversity within unity. There's different gifts. There's different expressions. There's different workings, but they're all for the same God. Paul goes on to elaborate. He talks about, can the eye say to the ear that it's upset because it's not the ear? Can the toe say to the knee that he's upset because he's not the knee? It wouldn't make any sense at all. Our bodies have all kinds of different parts with different functions, but they make up one body. So it is with Christ. The body of Christ has many different parts, many different expressions, many different giftings, many different workings. But we cannot be upset if someone doesn't have the gifting that we wish they had, or if we don't have the gifting someone else had. We shouldn't be upset if someone worships as a different expression than we have. And if I'm be real, this was a struggle for me. You see, I grew up, well, outside the church, but I went to a Catholic school. 
And so we went to Catholic mass during the school day and things like that. And so the only expression of worship of church I knew was high liturgy. The priest wears robes, there's chanting, there's a hymn book, all of that. And then when I started dating my, well, then girlfriend, now wife, I decided, you know what? I'm going to go to her parents' church to try to impress them. And guess what? Didn't work. Yeah. Uh, we're getting ready to celebrate 16 years of marriage, and they're still not impressed. But anyways, <laughs> they're not here, so I can say that. Anyways, when we went to their church, it was Assemblies of God Church. And if you're familiar with Assemblies of God, very expressive in a very different way than the Catholic Church is. And I found myself sitting there wondering, what are all of these people doing? And what is wrong with them? Because the default I had, of course, was, well, I worship the right way. <laughs> they just don't know. And then fast forward a little bit, and God had to check my pride uh, to say, we all worship different, different expressions. And it's a beautiful thing. We have diversity within unity as we worship. That's another piece of this puzzle. What's another piece? Skip down. Let's see here. My Bible's falling apart. Now I can't find it. There we go. We're going to look at chapter 14 in just a moment. And here I'm going to define terms before we get there. Here Paul talks about prophecy and tongues. Prophecy is often considered when someone hears, discerns a word from the Lord, and shares it with somebody. Typically, the word from the Lord that we hear, that we share, is right from this, straight from the Word of God. The Scriptures tell us that prophecy submits to the Word of God. In fact, prophecy submits to the spirit of the prophets. And so prophecy is hearing or discerning the Word from the Lord. And when I say hearing, I don't mean the clouds parting and hearing an audible voice, even though that is a thing. Typically, the hearing it's, it's much deeper than that. It's much louder than that. Whenever I've experienced hearing from the Lord, I have not experienced an audible voice, but I experienced it right here. And so that's prophecy. Tongues, we've referenced tongues already in this series. That refers to praying in a heavenly language, in an unknown language. Before we talked about tongues and different aspects or parts of Scripture, it talks about praying or speaking in a known language, typically a language the person doesn't know. Uh, but through a miracle, through an act of God, he just downloads them the information and they start speaking in that language. Here, when we talk about tongues, we're talking about praying in an unknown language. You've heard it, or you may have heard it referred to as a heavenly language, as tongues of angels, something like that. And so keep that in mind as we read. Look at chapter 14 and verse 1. And here Paul says, Follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the Spirit. But the one who prophesies speak to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. Anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies themselves, but the one who prophesies edifies the church. I would like that every one of you speak in tongues, but I would rather have you prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless someone interprets so that the church may be edified. Now, brothers and speakers, brothers and sisters, <laughs> would help if I could read. Remember, my Bible's falling apart. If I come to you and speak in tongues... What good will I be to you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or word of instruction? Even in the case of lifeless things that make sound, such as the pipe or the harp, how will anyone know what tune is being played unless there is a distinction in the notes? Again, if the trumpet does not sound a clear call, who will get ready for battle? So it is with you. Unless you speak intelligible words with your tongue, how will anyone know what you're saying? You will just be speaking into the air. Undoubtedly, there are all sorts of languages in the world, yet none of them is without meaning. If then I do not grasp the meaning of what someone is saying, I am a foreigner to that speaker, and the speaker is a foreigner to me. So it is with you. Since you are eager for the gifts of the Spirit, try to excel in those that build up 
the church. I hope you're beginning to notice a theme about how the constant call in our worship, especially our worship together, is to be others-focused. Now here, Paul is not beating up on tongues. Paul says elsewhere, he says, I speak in tongues more than anybody. You heard him say there, I wish everyone did. But he's saying, remember, tongues has a place, prophecy has a place. The way I would try to characterize this is this. Another piece of the worship puzzle, we make room for each other. We make room for our different giftings, for our different experiences, for the different traditions that we grew up with. We make room. We make room for prophecy. We want to make room for tongues. Now, how exactly do we do that? We'll talk about that here in just a little bit when we try to put these pieces together. The third piece, we make room. Another piece of this puzzle. Skip down to verse 21 in chapter 14. Paul is writing. He says, In the law it is written, With other tongues and through the lips of foreigners I will speak to this people, but even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Tongues then are a sign not for believers but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is not for unbelievers but for believers. So if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues and the inquirers or unbelievers come in, will they not say that you're out of your mind? But if an unbeliever or an inquirer comes in while everyone is prophesying, they are convicted of sin and brought under judgment by all, as the secrets of their hearts are laid bare. So they will fall down, worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. Our fourth puzzle piece when it comes to how do we structure, how do we walk in worship together, we have to consider guests. We have to consider those that are outside the church. We have to consider those that maybe have never stepped into church before, ever. And maybe this is their first time walking into a church. We have to consider them as we walk in worship. It's very, very important. This past week, We had the privilege, we began a weekly study for our youth here at the church. We had about 10 teenagers gathered in a room right over there, and we started a study of Ephesians. Had such a great time. So thankful for Pablo, wherever he went. He's probably teaching kids because he's leading the teaching, uh, doing a phenomenal job. One of the teenagers that came never opened a Bible before. She told me she'd never been to a church before. We had all kinds of fun. Because then I got to sit next to her, and when, we, and when Pablo said, hey, open your Bible to Ephesians, she turns to me and says, what's that? That's a great question. And so we opened it together, and I pointed right where it was. And then she starts to see all those little numbers in the way of the words, you know? Why are those numbers there? I think, oh, those are called verses. Just ignore them for now. You know, we're, we're going to read together. But we had this opportunity in our youth group to walk with a teenager that It's never been exposed to the ways of God, never been exposed to the word of God, never been exposed to the life of God that's revealed in the church. Now, in our youth group, we could have destructured it in such a way to where if you don't know where Ephesians is, if you don't know who Paul is, if you don't know what the Bible is, then this just isn't for you because we're going to move on. Instead, we structured it in such a way so that teenagers who have no concept of God's word can come, can engage in the conversation, participate, feel welcome, feel comfortable. This specific teenager came again uh, yesterday to some of our, our events and whatnot. You know, of course, I walked up, hi, how are you? Big smile on her face, hi, Michael. So we were able to have a good time because she felt welcomed. She felt like she belonged uh, right here in our youth gathering. As we consider worship, we have to consider guests. We have to consider newcomers. We have to consider even people may have followed the Lord their whole life, but are moving on from one faith tradition and looking at another one. We have to consider all of that. The last piece of our puzzle for today, and look at the very end of chapter 14, verses 39. Paul says, therefore, my brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues. Remember, we make room. Paul's saying, make room. Verse 40, but everything should be done 
in a fitting and orderly way. The last piece of our puzzle is that as we walk and worship together, it must be done in an orderly way. It must be done in a way that follows some semblance of an orderly way. Now, in case you missed it, go ahead and put up all five of our puzzle pieces. This is what we're given from the scriptures, from what we just read. That worship is to be for the common good. It's supposed to express diversity within unity. That we're called to make room for different expressions, for different giftings. That we need to consider guests, consider people who are coming into a church, maybe for the first time. And that everything must be done in an orderly way. With all of this in mind, is it any wonder that churches struggle, have strife and conflict over what worship is supposed to look like? Go ahead and put those back up there. Each one of them, they are vague on purpose. Even the first one, that we're supposed to have our worship for the common good. Well, define that. What's the common good? We all have different ideas, different expressions for that. That we have diversity within unity, differences within unity. What does that look like? It shouldn't be any surprise that we have so many different churches, so many different denominations. Think about the freedom that we have to worship in this grid. And within that freedom, we're all going to worship a slightly different way. God gives us great freedom when he comes to worship. You're not going to find a scripture that says, We can only worship with organs, though I love the organ. You're not going to find a scripture that says you can't worship with an electric guitar. You're not going to find a scripture that says you have to have four songs, or you have to sing a cappella, or you have to wear certain clothes when you worship. You're not going to find a scripture that says that. You're going to find a scripture that has these puzzle pieces right here. And then God invites us to the journey, to the dance, really, of putting these pieces together and seeing what they look like. Now, in that puzzle I showed you at the beginning, 2,000 pieces, when we finally got that thing put together, it took the better part of nine or 10 months, and at the rhythm at the time, because we had little ones, seems like just about every season of life we have little ones, but anyways, in that season, we had this big cardboard sheet that we did the puzzle on when the kids were in bed, and then we would slide it under the couch. It fit perfectly under the couch, and that's where we kept it. And then we didn't, it's not like we told our kids, hey, don't dig under the couch. We didn't tell them anything, because it's out of sight, out of mind, right? And if you tell them, hey, don't do this, what are you asking them to do? Well, wait till mom's not looking, and I'm going to go see what's going on over there. And so we just left it there. But then when we got it put together, we doused that thing in glue on the top. And then one of the scariest moments of that whole process, we had to flip the puzzle over, so that we could glue the back. And you don't know fear until you've spent hundreds of hours on a puzzle and you have to flip it. Uh, uh, Anyways, and then we glued all over the back of it. When we look at this puzzle right here, what is the glue that holds it all together? I submit to you today that the glue that holds worship together is the Holy Spirit expressed in love for one another. We read from 1 Corinthians 12. We've read from 1 Corinthians 14. I used to be a math teacher. There's a number in between. What's between 12 and 14? Hey, there we go. We could all be math teachers. 1 Corinthians 13, one of the most famous chapters in all of Scripture. If you've ever been to a wedding, you've heard this chapter read, at least in part or referenced. And what's interesting about it This chapter's got nothing to do with weddings. It's got nothing to do with romantic love. I've done several weddings. I've read this chapter at every one of them. And so I'm I'm, I'm a part of that as well. When Paul wrote in chapter 12 about worshiping together, and then in chapter 14 about worshiping together, does it make sense to say Paul's writing, okay, we need to talk about how to worship together, different expressions, same God. Oh, wait a minute. I want to talk about weddings for a bit. Moving on, chapter 14. Okay, back to worshiping together. No, it doesn't work. Chapter 13, when it talks about love, he's referring to the love that God calls us to have for each other as we navigate this dance of worshiping together. As we look at putting these different pieces of the puzzle together, and we might do that just a little bit different from each other, 
Paul is saying that we are to be united in love. With that in mind, look at chapter 13. Paul writes, If I speak in tongues of men or angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. All of these things that cause so many divisions in churches, they're not the main thing. Well, what is love? As the philosopher Hathaway once asked. Look at verse 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Just imagine with me for a moment. What would a church look like that looked like this? What impact would that church have on its members, on its community, if it looked just like that? How different would family be? How different would our nation be if it was described as verses 4 through 7, what we just read? Verse 8, love never fails. It never ends. It never lets us down. There's no end date to love. It is eternal. But where there are prophecies, they will cease because prophecy is not the main thing. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled because tongues aren't the main thing. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away because any of our knowledge, it's not the main thing. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, when the perfect comes, as some of your translations might say, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then, on that day, we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. So often, especially when it comes to worship, we feel the temptation, the same temptation that I gave into that I had to repent of, of saying, well, the way I naturally worship, that must be the way. And everybody who does it differently, oh, they just must be mistaken. That's the way of a child. You notice when Paul in there, he says, when I was a child, I thought like a child, I acted like a child. For years, I've read that chapter and I wondered, Paul, why in the world are you talking about kids all of a sudden? It's because this mindset that insists on its own way that says whatever I want to do is what we are going to do. That's the mindset of a child. If you've been around kids for any length of time, you've seen the joy they have, the laughter they've had, you've seen them light up a room by a smile, and you've seen them throw down over who gets to put the ball away. Or, and someone rings the doorbell, and then there's a stampede in the house to see who can get to the door first to open it. Those are childish ways. And Paul says, when I became an adult, I put the childish ways behind me. As we grow in our walk in Christ, we put these childish ways of interacting with God, interacting with each other behind us. This puzzle that we have, this dance of wonder that God invites us into, it's held together by love. So now, we've been talking about Corinth, We've talked about the universal church. 
Let's zoom in a ton. What does this tension, what does this dance look like at center point? Given all the different puzzle pieces, in fact, can we put those puzzle pieces back up there, John? Given the con looking for the common good, given the fact that we're called to make room for one another, given the fact that we need to consider guests, consider those who are new to the church, that everything must be done in an orderly way. Do we have those? No, they went away. Okay, our puzzle pieces are lost. You ever try to do a puzzle and you can't find, you know, <laughs> the person's nose? That's what, that's what we're experiencing right now. And that's okay, it's just part of it. What does that look like here at the church? Well, it looks like several different things. One, as a leadership team, the worship team that you see up here, they don't get here at 9.15 on Sunday morning and scratch their heads and say, well, what do you want to play? Well, I don't know. What do you want to play? That doesn't happen. Every gathering that we have on Sundays has been covered in prayer for weeks, for months. We as a leadership team, the worship team, the speakers, the different aspects of different roles that we have has been praying for this specific service months ago. Right now, we're praying and studying and preparing for gatherings that we're going to have months from now. It's all been covered in prayer. Sometimes there's this prevailing thought that says that something can only be of the Spirit if it's spontaneous, that if it's planned, it can't be of the Spirit. I don't see that anywhere in Scripture. In fact, in Scripture, I see the exact opposite. In fact, I had one guy, a friend of mine, so I won't say who, but anyways, we were preparing a sermon series, and it was 12, 13, 14 weeks, something like that. And my friend, he likes to do sermon series that are about four weeks, give or take. He doesn't like to go beyond four. Okay. And so he asked me, he says, oh, so you're planning out your next 12 Sundays. He says, why don't you leave room for the Spirit to move in the midst of it? To which, of course, I responded, well, hey, my God knows the end from the beginning. Does yours? <laughs> We can plan and pray and prepare in the Spirit. In fact, that's what God calls us to. Now, also, we hold our plans with an open hand because sometimes when the worship team comes and they have their set, they have their four or five songs that they're going to do, sometimes during rehearsal or even right before service, someone just says, hey, I feel like God's taking us a different direction. And someone else says, you know, I'm feeling the same thing. And so then they have to call an audible, which is our worship team does that, and then our AV team has to scramble to find the song on the fly so that we can get it up on the screen. It's a fun little dance. But we hold our plans with an open hand. On a personal level, this message was going to go a very different direction. Yesterday, I don't know if it was during the funeral or when it was, but I just sensed the leading of the Spirit to say, worship is wonder. That connection was not planned, was not prepared. It's not even in the notes. But it's where I feel the Lord is leading us, that he would remind us to walk in worship is to walk in wonder. Sometimes you'll see, so what does that look like with prophecy, for example? Sometimes you'll see as we're over here worshiping that someone comes over and they speak with me. Or before church starts even, sometimes people come at 8.30 or 9, and they'll say, Michael, I feel like this is what the Lord's saying. In fact, it was a couple weeks ago. Karen, you came up at like 9 o'clock when you had that poem. And then we shared that. Sometimes people come up and speak. And in the midst of that, the struggle is always this. When I sense that the Lord is speaking something or is sharing something within, well, to me, the natural temptation is to think, okay, so this must be what the Lord's showing everybody. And sometimes that's true. And sometimes that's not. And so how we try to navigate the dance at center point is we ask people, if you feel like you have a word from the Lord, come and talk to the pastors. And we'll sit with it, we'll ruminate, we'll pray over it together. And sometimes we bring the person up to share the word. Sometimes one of us will just share the word for them. Sometimes, and I think this happens the most, when people come over and share, hey, I think this is what the Lord's saying. I can show them in my Bible, this is exactly what I'm looking at too. And so it becomes a word of confirmation. Now, sometimes when people come up and share and say, hey, I think this is a word from the Lord, we'll sit with it for a minute, and then for whatever reason, it just doesn't, it just doesn't fit. And in those cases, we don't share. And that doesn't mean that that person was wrong. It doesn't mean that the word was bad. It doesn't mean any of those things. It just means 
as we're praying into the service, as we're sensing the Lord's leading and calling within our gatherings, that specific word is just not the right time for that. Now, the obvious question that someone should ask would be, well, what happens when you're wrong? And the answer is, we probably mess it up more than we get it right. There's been times that we haven't shared words that we should have shared. There's been times that we've shared words that we shouldn't have have shared. And in the midst of that, knowing that we're going to mess up this dance at certain times, we're going to step on each other's toes. We're going to remember the glue that holds us together is love. Another aspect of worship that Paul brings up is tongues. As you're gathering, as you've been here, you may have heard people praying in the heavenly language either under the breath, individually. Sometimes people lean in together and pray. If you go to a few different small groups or prayer meetings, sometimes there's people there that will pray in tongues. It's a beautiful thing. Paul calls us. He says, I wish that y'all, I wish everybody would speak in tongues. Now, the mistake that some folks make in some denominations is they say, you don't have the Holy Spirit unless you speak in tongues. Now, that's going way too far. Tongues is a gift given to some not to everyone. And from what I can gather from Scripture, probably not even to most. And those that have the gift of tongues are called to exercise it responsibly within the constraints of Scripture that are laid. As a church, how do we do that? I remember we were doing, it's been a month or so ago, a new members course, new members class. And we had this big dry erase board. And on one side, I had asked, what are things the church should be doing? Most open-ended question ever. And we filled that thing with everything under the sun that the church should be involved in, from worship to praying to preaching to teaching kids to giving to serving. You pick something. We filled that thing. And then I flipped the board over because on the other side, I had broken up that board into seven days, 24 hours. And then I had asked, What does it feel like, or does it make sense to say everything that the church is called to do, if it's not done, and I colored in one bar between 9.30 and 11 on Sunday, does it make sense to say, therefore, the church isn't involved in it? And of course, with that visual, the answer is, well, no, that's absurd. We're not going to be able to do everything the church calls us to do on Sunday mornings from 9.30 to 11. That's why we have other groups that meet throughout the week. That's why each one of us is called to be a minister of God in our own walks, so that as the church, we can fulfill the calling of the church. And so with that in mind, when it comes to tongues, here on Sunday mornings as a church, we don't practice corporate tongues. We don't practice that time where everybody will speak in a tongue together. And the reason why? We consider outsiders. We consider guests. We consider those who don't know, don't, they have no experience with that. Now, does that mean that we're not for tongues? Of course not. You've heard me just mention how many different groups we have and people that pray in tongues, and it's a beautiful thing. It just means as we try to navigate this dance, that's been our heritage at the church for years, and that's how we walk in it together. Overall, in our worship, we follow what our worship team is doing for us. Church, I have said this before, and I'll say it again because I feel like sometimes we might not quite understand it. You know, when you get used to something, you start to forget how remarkable and amazing it is. We have an amazing worship team. Our worship leader, Aaron Nelson, is amazing. And he speaks with the prophetic between songs. The songs themselves are prophetic in nature. He has prayed into that. He has sought the Lord's will into it. He is building a team that seeks the Lord's will together. And so our default as a church is to follow the leadership of the team, follow what our worship team is leading us into. That's how we walk together in an orderly way. In fact, this is the key part that so many who forego Sundays, who say, I can have God, but I don't need to gather with the church, This is the part that they miss. They miss what it is to submit our own desires to one another, to submit our own inclinations to one another. Instead, and I've known, I've got friends that do this, where they, I like the worship from this church and the preaching from that church, and I like the Bible study at this church. 
when they're walking in that, they're saying, I want this style of worship, and I want this style of preaching, and I want this style of Bible study. And I'm unwilling to submit any of those to a group. The beautiful dance that God calls us to is one of worship, one of wonder together about taking our own desires, taking what's prime in our own lives and submitting that to one another. In such a way, we worship together. That is how we experience the unity that comes from worship. That's how we experience what it is to walk in the Holy Spirit, to walk in wonder. Worship team, would you come up here? I was reminded, this thing, I was, I was reminded to walk with the Spirit is to walk in wonder. There are so many examples of that from Scripture. If we were to say them all, we'd be here all day. But here's a really well-known psalm where I think David, I think we see how he walks in wonder. And then I'm going to invite each one of us to wonder together as we sing. David writes this in Psalm chapter 8. He says, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. It sounds like wonder to me. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. Oh Lord, you have made them a little lower than the angels. You have crowned them with glory and honor. You have made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, and all that swim in the paths of the sea. Oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth to walk with the Holy Spirit, O church, is to walk with wonder. How do you know if you're walking with the Holy Spirit? You see more wonder around you. You see more about how creation itself cries out to God. You begin to wonder more at the marvelous works that God's done in your own life and how he's working in your life. You begin to notice if you used to struggle greatly with anger, if you found yourself yelling at your spouse or yelling at your coworkers, but then you realized, hey, I just went through a really difficult thing and I didn't yell and I didn't get angry. And then you wonder, oh Lord, you are so good to me. To walk with the Spirit is to walk with wonder. Let's pray. Lord, we want to be people of wonder. We want to be people filled with awe at the wonderful things you do, at the wonderful person you are. God, open our eyes that we might see you. Open our ears that we might hear you. Open our hearts that we might know you. Each one of us, Lord. We want to know you more today than we did yesterday. We want to see more wonder in our lives today than we did yesterday. And it's not because we, that there's nothing around us to wonder at or to see your goodness in. It's because we so often miss it. We walk around with our spiritual eyes closed, so to speak. We miss the wonders of who you are and what you do. Help us to see you, oh God. More than anything, we want to see you. Thank you, oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit.
Spirit, as we open our hearts and our minds to follow you, to walk with you, to be filled with you yet again. We walk with wonder. Amen. At this time, I invite you to please stand.